infrastructure and digital twins. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're already doing some collaboration, actually, because unbeknownst to me, Peter has, um, has said an awful lot of the stuff that I might otherwise have said. Uh, I, I agree very much with, uh, with his definition of the digital twin. And hopefully what I can do now as I look uh, at digital twins in infrastructure is build on that. Uh, so the way I'd like to do this is starting off with some context... Uh, and uh, I add in a couple more slides at the last minute, having listened to this morning's uh, presentations. Uh, and so this will provide some context, seeing where the thinking is coming from in relation to infrastructure. Uh, and then what I'd like to do is talk about the National Digital Twin, uh, which is very much about talking uh, on, in, uh, on the um, digital twins for infrastructure. So if we start off on this context, looking at infrastructure as a system of systems, because I heard a lot about construction this morning. Construction is unbelievably important, but I think we need to see it in perspective. Uh, and for me, one of the key perspectives uh, is that of infrastructure as a system of systems. Uh, and what I mean by this is that basically we've been building infrastructure for at least 200 years. Uh, and whether that's in water or transport or energy, we've been building systems, and those systems are now interconnected. So effectively, we now have infrastructure as a system of systems. Uh, and what that system of systems does is provide services that lead to beneficial social, economic, and environmental outcomes. And so what I'm putting here is that I think the big important thing here is infrastructure as a system of systems. And then we can see construction in that context as being one of many interventions on that system of systems to keep it going, to make it fit for what we want in the future. But construction uh, as an investment intervention is one of many. It could be an operational intervention uh, or it could be a maintenance intervention, all of which are important to keep this big throbbing machine of infrastructure going. Because if that infrastructure machine breaks down, then so does society. It is that important to us. So, one perspective. And I think if we're looking at infrastructure from that perspective, we can see that uh, in developed economies, uh, we now have a lot more infrastructure that is already built than that we build each year. And clearly we can point to other parts of the world where infrastructure is emerging, you know, maybe where they uh, hardly have rule of law or hardly have contract law or hardly have a supply chain. And not surprisingly, um, infrastructure struggles to follow. And then we can point to other parts of the world where the name of the game is just build. You know, it's a growth phase of infrastructure. But in developed economies, we're in this place where each year what we build is a tiny fraction of what we already have. Uh, and in the UK, uh, that, that fraction is that we've got about 99.5% of the infrastructure that we already need. And then each year, we add 0.5%. Now, that 0.5% is still measured in billions. It's really, really important. So I don't want to denigrate the delivery of new assets. It's just to say that there is also 99.5%. And how important is that? And so what I think this means is that we need a mind shift, a change of mind from growth phase to mature phase. And what we seem to be working with still is an industry which is based around growth phase thinking, but we have mature phase infrastructure. And so the kind of thing that I'm talking about here is a shift from the growth phase thinking of just asset creation to a focus on asset management. Also, a shift from the focus on the initial cost, you know, the capex, to whole life cost. A shift from a focus on delivering outputs for clients to delivering outcomes for the ultimate customer. There's a lot of big shifts in thinking that are needed. Uh, and in the UK, as I'll come back to, uh, we are really trying hard to make that shift. And there are some very good messages coming out of government just now uh, which help us to make this shift. But it's a difficult shift because it's very easy for us to think about the industry being the construction industry. And as soon as we talk about the construction industry, then we think about building stuff rather than operating, maintaining, and using stuff. But let's just remember that 99.5% versus 0.5%. And so if we look at the whole of the built environment uh, through its whole life cycle, 
and I've just borrowed terminology from ISO 55000, then we can see that there's definitely the creation of those assets, but then there's the, also the operation, the maintenance, the use of them, and then something that might come at the end of life. And hopefully, hopefully as we move towards a more circular economy, then what happens at the end will actually be the beginning of something else. So that's what we see in terms of a life cycle, but also we can see these different bits of of infrastructure and or the overall built environment. The economic infrastructure, you know, power, transport, water, telecoms and waste, social infrastructure, residential buildings, etc. So if we're looking at the construction industry, then really it's that slice. But surely that's not enough. You know, what we should be looking at maybe is a slice the other way. And maybe we should be talking about the infrastructure industry. Certainly what we should be thinking about is whole life because there's a lot more value to be gained through the whole life rather than just focusing on construction. So hopefully I've made, made that point, but I will keep coming back to it. Um, so this is seeing the same thing maybe in a, in a different way. There we have the infrastructure in use and then the assets in delivery. And I think that what we're talking about overall here is a digital transformation of the whole thing. We're not just digitally transforming the delivery of new assets. Um, it's the whole thing. So by the wonders of changing color, we now have digitally transformed. So we've got smart infrastructure and digital delivery. So I think a lot of concentration has gone on to that digital delivery. And rightly so. There's an awful lot of value to be had from that. But if we're talking about digital twins in infrastructure, then we're really talking about something bigger than just delivery. Um, within digital delivery, we're very familiar with the foundational BIM. It's incredibly important, but I can see that almost like a Trojan horse because what that has done is enabled the industry, in inverted commas, to realize how important information management is. And as soon as we see the value of managing information through design and construction, then obviously we want to manage information through its asset life cycle. So we get into asset information management. We see the value of a common data environment on a project, so then we can start seeing the value of a common data environment across many projects, you know, across a whole program. Uh, and then it makes obvious sense to have digital component catalogs. We can move into design automation. But there's not really much point in moving up that advancement curve if we haven't sorted out the basics at the bottom. And then we get into the whole thing of end-to-end -end delivery platforms. You know, we can see that DFMA, Design for Manufacture and Assembly, is enabled by this better information management. And then maybe we get to this stage at the top uh, around a connected data environment, not just a common data environment, but where we're genuinely starting to connect data. Now, that's where it starts, I think, to get very interesting, and we can see even more value being released. And if we've done all of these things, then I think that the delivery process at the bottom of this changes as well. It becomes much more integrated. So instead of us seeing a, you know, the starting point being planning and then design and then building and then operation downstream of it, really, I think we can start to see it the other way around completely, where actually the starting point is the operation, maintenance, and use of this system of systems. And what that can kick off are various different types of intervention on the system of systems, one of which is capital investment, but it's not the only thing. So if we're looking at smart infrastructure, uh, we've already talked about, I heard a lot on, um, on Industry 4.0. I think the essence of this is bringing physical and digital together. Now, in the industry, maybe not in this room, but in the industry at wide, uh, then I think there's a lot of familiarity with the physical assets. People understand that. You can see it and touch it. You can see the value of it. But it's hard for some to see the value of the digital assets. Now, we're getting our heads around the value of BIM and GIS, and we're seeing that actually those should be integrated. And that, what that tells us is where the assets are and what they are. That's useful. But also, you can see other layers of data, which could be the status of the assets, or the performance of the assets, or the condition of the assets. Each of these layers of data adds a richer picture to those, that digital twin that you can start to imagine emerging. And then we can see some serious value for those digital assets. 
So one of the things that we as an industry need to do is start recognizing digital assets as assets and managing them properly. What that means is putting a proper value on them and managing them, just the same as we do with the physical assets. And then when we bring them together, then we have smart infrastructure. It's the merging of digital and physical, which we're saying is smart infrastructure. But actually, all this is, is applying Industry 4.0 to infrastructure. And so we don't just have a cyber physical system, which we'd be familiar with from uh, Industry 4.0. What this starts to describe is a cyber physical system of systems. You, and that has immense value, and we need to manage it properly. And part of what happens in Industry 4.0 for managing assets and digital assets together properly are digital twins. So now we can start to imagine a digital twin of infrastructure being of absolutely huge value. Uh, and what it does is deliver those outcomes that we talked about. <clears throat> And I think that we can see through the information value chain how you can go from data to outcomes. So let me introduce this very briefly. What this is trying to show you, the very simple kind of triangle type diagram, is the data coming in from the environment, which could come in from anywhere. It could come in from sensors, it could come in from the Twitter fire hose, it could come in from satellite data. It's just data. It comes in. And that data as we currently have it in the industry, goes into silos, and never the twain shall meet. So there's, there's a lot of work we have to do in terms of data management to break silos, get the data to be a little bit more interoperable between systems, etc. Uh, but actually, that data doesn't have any real ongoing value until we start making sense of it. When we make sense of the data, then it generates insights, and those insights can lead us to better decisions. And it's the decisions that then lead to better interventions, and the better interventions lead to better outcomes. Uh, and so what we can see through that is this direct connection between data and outcomes. Outcomes is what we want, remember, in the shift of thinking to the, um, uh, the mature phase. Outcomes is what we're driving for, and there's a direct connection to data. But the fulcrum of that and the value proposition, the reason why we do all this, is better decisions. That's, what is, you know, that's where the value comes. Uh, and I think that understanding this information value chain in the context of a digital twin provides us with the purpose. It was something that Peter talked about, you know, the importance of the purpose of the digital twin. Um, and uh, where the value gets released, um, I put to you, is uh, in making better decisions faster. So all of that was context. And taking all of that on board, uh, that becomes a large part um, of the thinking behind the vision for Digital Built Britain. That vision is now um, under the guardianship of CDBB. That's the Centre for Digital Built Britain uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, and their vision goes well beyond design and build. It goes into the operate phase, where you can see that information value chain generating real value in operation of assets. But it goes beyond that as well, into what they're describing as integration, where you can see that same value chain with better decisions leading to better outcomes um, at a societal level. You know, better inclusive social outcomes, better environmental outcomes, better economic outcomes. So this becomes quite a big thing with a big vision. And it's underpinned by these aligned government messages. First of all, the industrial strategy, which has set the tone very nicely. Transforming infrastructure performance, which I think, for the first time, really clearly has pointed to the importance of the existing infrastructure and doesn't just focus on building new. A really key thing for government to be saying. And then finally, this, uh, this report which came out from the National Infrastructure Commission called Data the Public Good. And Data the Public Good, I think, is a seminal report because it made three really key and, I think, visionary recommendations. Uh, the first one is that in the UK, we should move towards having a national digital twin. And the point of that twin, the purpose, going back to Peter, is to help plan, predict, and manage assets at a national level. So quite an important thing. They also recommended that we should put in place a framework, a digital framework, to enable effective information management and secure interoperability between different systems. Now, that's really key. And if we picked up the message about the semantics earlier on, what that points to is the potential for an upper ontology that will then make sense of data models that sit below it. 
So that's the framework. And then in order to facilitate the framework, they recommended the formation of this mouthful um, that Anthony was getting his teeth around earlier, the Digital Framework Task Group. And what that does is bring together government, industry, and academia to deliver the framework in pursuance of the National Digital Twin. So this is huge. We see it as a 30-year journey. And what we had to do is really set out the first three years of that journey in a roadmap. So what the framework is all about is enabling effective information management across the whole built environment. Really, you could simplify it down to saying it's about getting the right information in the right hands at the right time to make the right decision. That's fundamentally what it is. But you can imagine doing that across the whole built environment is a big thing. Uh, and by enabling secure, resilient data sharing, then it facilitates the national digital twin. I'll come back to that because you might be wondering what we mean by that. So the Digital Framework Task Group got going in July last year. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but what happens in the UK is that National Infrastructure Commission makes a recommendation. It doesn't become a thing until Treasury approves it. They approved it in July last year. So now the Digital Framework Task Group is official thing, uh, and we're up and running. Uh, we came up with two key bits of output during 2018. Uh, the first one is what we call the Gemini Principles, and the second is a roadmap. I'll introduce them very briefly. So the Gemini Principles uh, was, uh, well, it's a, it's a document. Uh, you can download it. It's a very nice, easy-to-read document. What it's about, really, uh, is setting out some values-based principles that we can carry with us on this 30-year journey. You know, we're going to see multiple generations delivering this, and so there needs to be consistent values that can be handed on like a baton um, through those 30 years. So we thought it was really important to start with the values. And you, know, you see it there, purpose is at the top. It must have a purpose. It must be trustworthy, must uh, function effectively. I'd love to go into these in more detail, but there isn't time. The other thing that the Gemini principles do uh, is outline the definition of digital twins in the context of built environment and a national digital twin. So you've heard all about digital twins now, so I hardly need to introduce it. In the essence, it's this realistic digital representation, but it's a little bit more than that. So on the next slide, I'll come back to it. The national digital twin, just maybe to calm you down if you're worried about it, uh, is not one massive twin of everything. The idea of the national digital twin is that it's an ecosystem of connected twins. And that's really key, because what connects the twins is secure data sharing. Uh, and that's the hard bit. A digital twin sounds like fun. The secure data sharing in the background is hard work. And how do you get secure data sharing? Well, actually, you've got to do all that hard work with ontologies and semantics, etc., to enable that to work. So that's what the National Digital Twin is. Uh, and I've represented diagrammatically here uh, how I see uh, digital twins. And it kind of picks up on, on what Peter was saying earlier on. But I, I think one of the key things that makes a digital twin a twin rather than just any old model is this two-way connection. There's data going one way, which enables the insights, makes the better decisions, that leads to interventions. So there's a connection going the other way, from the digital twin into the physical twin. And it's that two-way connection that actually is part of the defining characteristics of a digital twin. And those interventions lead to better outcomes. So we see digital twins as having these, these two-way connections. What we'd also say is that that connection does not have to be real-time. If the purpose is operational, then yes, it makes sense to be real-time. But if the purpose is for planning, then that data connection, you know, it might be just with a refresh rate of a month or even a year. So it's not how frequent the refresh rate is. or you know, It's not about um, whether it's being real-time. What matters is right time. Uh, right time for the purpose of the digital twin. Uh, so I think that's just a bit of a clarification. And I have to say, it's slightly different from some of the definitions that you'll find if you just Google digital twins. We don't think it has to be real time. It has to be right time, uh, which is to do with the purpose. But I totally agree with Peter. There's multiple digital twins uh, for multiple different purposes. Uh, and if we can get them to connect, uh, then you've got some real value. The other thing I said that we've done is the, uh, the roadmap. Uh, and uh, sensing a shortness of time, I'll, I'll scoot through this very quickly. Um, 
We identified five different streams of this roadmap. It's due to be published, I think, even later on this week. Uh, but what this does is set out under those five streams um, the route from where we are now to this vision, the vision owned by Centre for Digital World Britain. Within that, there are a number of interconnected um, components. Uh, and um, just to show you on the next slide that this does exist rather than just a diagram, uh, but it's unreadable. Uh, there is the, uh, 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 what it actually looks like. Um, it will be completely readable when you engage with it online, uh, maybe later on this week. I've already mentioned that this is a 30-year journey, we see. Um, but what we're mapping out here is the first three years. And the idea of those first three years is to get far enough up the adoption curve that we're really going. We're off the ground and we just have to keep going. I'd like to touch on this very briefly to talk about the overall approach because um, there would be, I think, two key ways of getting this wrong because you know, this is a big, important national journey that we're on. One way of getting it wrong, I think, would be a purely top-down approach, uh, which would be, I think, quite authoritarian. The authoritarian way would be to lock some experts in a room to come up with the perfect way of doing things and to impose it on the industry. The industry wouldn't respond well to that. Another way, which I don't think would work, is being completely Darwinian, where we let a thousand flowers bloom and see which one ends up being tallest and say we'll pick that. It doesn't necessarily lead to the optimum solution. And so what we're thinking about is a pragmatic middle way, which is about working with people like this community here, who know what they're talking about, who can help us on the journey, um, and we can work with what we've already got and the structures which already exist, but also you know, we can learn from the experts. So it's kind of learning from experience, learning from experts coming together uh, and seeing what works. Um, and, and so basically the overall approach is fundamentally pragmatic. Within this, we see that there are three layers of governance which are important. The governmental policy layer, implementation layer, and then the ultimate customers, which I said earlier on, are really the whole purpose of doing this. Uh, I'd, again, love to talk about this in more detail, but I'm just going to have to scoot through it. What we see here is the real importance of the client organizations, because it's what the clients ask for, which is what the supply chain then delivers. You know, it's the client's requirements which basically make everything else happen. Uh, and so we see that this connection between CDBB and the client groups, this one here is the infrastructure client group, as being key. Um, and around th those, we have CDBB with this collection of organizations. Uh, we can go into them in, in more detail later if you want. Uh, but they are uh, um, organizations from government, industry, and academia coming together to work out what should be done. Uh, but then also on the infrastructure client group side, we've got major UK infrastructure clients who have procurement and supply chains uh, and you know, the means of getting things done. And so the connection between these we see as being absolutely key uh, to actually delivering the change which is required. And then the final thing I just wanted to say is that as part of this, uh, we're establishing a digital twin hub. It's easier to say as DT hub. What the point of this is, is to bring together in a community those who are making the most serious progress with digital twins so they can share with each other. Uh, and then we see that as being an engine to develop experience. The experience lead to guidance. The guidance lead to standards. And so we're seeing this DT hub as being a key place um, for delivering all the stuff that I mentioned above. So that was a quick scoot through. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.